This is a Wild Game Production Podcast. You remember. Roll your stealth roll. Game books, pencils, pizza, cheese puffs, and a hell of a lot of dice. And the dragon woke up. Roll for initiative. This is the Roll for Initiative podcast, where 1E is the place to be. This is DM Matt here, and I am here at Gen Con 50, and I'm here with none other than the illustrious Rick Loomis of Flying Buffalo. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Yeah, yeah this would be Flying Buffalo's 41st Gen Con, I think? Yes, I was at Gen Con 9. Gen Con 9. It, so... Just give us a little history, comparing Gen Con 9 to now, what this, the industry has grown into. Oh, wow. It's, it's completely different now. <clears throat> Back then, it was almost all war games. Um, it, Gen Con 9 was at the Horticultural Hall in Lake Geneva, which was a small community building. Uh, the dealer's room was a porch, basically, uh, that was open to the outside, and I know I was worried at the time that if it rained, we were in big trouble. Um, I don't know how many people were there, but not anywhere close to what's, what comes to this show. I mean, there must have been, you know, a couple of hundred. I don't remember if, if I made enough sales to pay my expenses. <laughs> but I do remember I slept on somebody's living room floor instead of going to a hotel. Yeah, I was in a panel with Mike Carr talking about it, and, he was, and they were basically telling people, yeah, don't if you're from the West Coast, don't come to Gen Con if you can't sell at least $1,000 worth of stuff. Mm. Otherwise, you're not going to make any money yeah. because of the commute. Uh, but Flying Buffalo has been around since, like, 1970, and you were actually in the play-by-mail. Yes. Uh, how did you get started in that? Well, all through high school, I was inventing games um, and getting my friends to play them, and they were all multiplayer hidden movement games where you don't get to see what anybody else is doing unless you've got a unit in the area and somebody has to referee it. And I was always the referee. And in 1970, I was in the Army, uh, stationed in Hawaii, believe it or not. And I had a lot of time on my hands. So I invented a game that I wanted to try out and I started doing it by mail. I advertised in a magazine called The General uh, that was published by Avalon Hill. And it, they had a page on the back that uh, for opponents wanted. And so I put an ad in there saying, I'll, I'm going to run this multiplayer game. The rules are free. If you, if you play it and pay me 10 cents a turn, I'll be the referee. And that was back when postage was 8 cents. So I was going to make all of 2 cents from each player. And by the time I got out of the Army, I had 200 players. So I figured, well, maybe I can make a business out of this. And so I started doing it. What I had in mind was exactly what World of Warcraft is doing right now, the massively multiplayer online game where you got hundreds of people in the game and they're all doing stuff and the computer's keeping track of everything. That's exactly what I wanted to do. But there was no Internet. Right. So we did it by mail. Yeah. And you were calculating all that by hand. Uh, At the very beginning, I was doing it all by hand, and I met a guy in the Army that liked to write computer programs. Uh, he wrote machine language programs by hand for amusement. Um, and I asked him if he would write the program to, to keep track of this thing for me, and he did. And we rented time on a computer <clears throat> Excuse me, at, near, near the post, uh, there was a, a control data computer center across the street, and so we rented time on the computer to run the games. And so I was running computer-moderated games uh, by postal mail in 1970. Uh, and then when I got out of the Army, um, Steve, my programmer, agreed to come move to Arizona and keep programming for me, and I bought my own computer. So I call myself, and I've never been contradicted so far, the only person in the world who, the first person in the entire world who bought a computer just to play games on it. And that was a Raytheon 704 mini computer with 4K of memory, and the input and output was a teletypewriter. And so we would get the moves from people, 
We would type the moves into the computer. The computer would calculate the results. It would print it out on that yellow teletypewriter yeah. paper. We'd tear it off, stuff it in an envelope, and mail it to them. Yeah. And then, you, so you had the play-by-mail. Then was it the nuclear war card game came along and then Tunnels and Trolls, or...? I was about the same time, um, about the same time. There, there are two different stories there. The nuclear war... It was a game I had played in college back in 68 because uh, the game was first published in 65, and I loved it. It was great fun, but nobody was selling it anymore. Uh, so I was going to conventions, and I had made up a game that involved missiles and had the word nuclear in the title, and it wasn't really very good, so don't ask me about that one. But people saw that nuclear cloud on the cover and said, oh, is that that card game I used to play in college? It was great fun. I played it till the cards wore out. And I said to myself, any game they play till the cards wear out has got to be worthwhile. I mean, there's a lot of games you buy and you play it twice maybe. You know? But you play it over and over, then it's, it's a great game. So I decided I had to find this guy and, and buy the rights from him. So... I advertised in gaming magazines, but this guy wasn't a gamer. He was an aerospace engineer, and he had nothing to do with games. He just made this one game, tried to sell it, didn't really sell very many, and, and gave up on it. And so now we have to wait for the now loudspeaker to stop for a second because we can't hear what we're saying. I hate these loudspeaker things. I mean, I paid, you know, $2,000 to be here and sell stuff, and then they interfere with me. Right. Like, Sorry, hold on one second here, because I'm giving you my sales pitch. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, where was I? It was Nuclear War. Nuclear War, he, yeah, you tracked him down, not a gamer. Okay, I tried to track him down, so I offered a reward for anybody that could <laughs> okay. find him for You put me. a bounty out. You put a bounty out, and one of my friends went to the library and found a phone book. The only address we had was Doug Malawicki, Los Angeles. <laughs> so my friend went to the library and got a Los Angeles phone book and found a listing for Doug Malawicki. And I called that number. It was his ex-wife. She gave me his current phone number. And I called it, and an answering machine came on with a vampire voice and organ music <laughs> saying, Mr. Malawick is not home at the moment, but if you leave your blood, name and blood type, he will get back to you. Yeah. And I knew this was the guy that invented that stuff. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I got in touch, and he was very happy that somebody was still interested in his game. I, I bought the rights. I'm still paying him royalties. We're both very happy with each other. He's a wonderful guy. I love him. He's He, he runs 100-mile marathons. He builds giant robot dinosaurs. He's a great guy. And I've been building uh, expansion kits for his game and selling them all over the world. Yeah, awesome. And then, and then it was around this time you met uh, Ken St. Andre? And yeah, Ken St. Andre used to come over to my house on game nights. I had game nights every Wednesday night, and, and he would play games with us. And um, one of my employees at the time had an early copy of Dungeons & Dragons, and Ken borrowed it from him and sat down on the couch and read through it and said, this is too complicated. I don't understand it. So, but it's a great idea for a game, so I'll make up my own. So Ken made up his own version, printed up 150 copies at the University Copy Center, and gave them to and sold them to his friends. And he had, I think, 40 copies left. And he knew I was going to the Origins War Game Convention, which was in Baltimore, Maryland. And he asked me if I would sell his leftover copies. Now, I knew that nobody was going to buy this stupid game. I mean, it, it wasn't. It didn't have a board. It didn't have pieces. There, there was no winner at the end. You know, that wasn't the kind of game I like to play. I figured nobody would want to play that. But you know, I want to be a nice guy. So hey, just sure to keep a little space. Why yeah, not? I'll, I'll try to sell one or two for you. And to my amazement, all 40 of them sold in one weekend. So I came back home and said, hey, Ken, I'd like to publish your game. <laughs> and it's, that's the beginning of the story. Yeah, and then from there, it's just grown. Uh, you're up to like 5.5? Uh, actually, we did a 7, and then we did uh -huh. Deluxe. Okay. So we're actually... Actually, I probably nine, but we quit numbering no, them. You just yeah, it's just tunnels and trolls. People know what they're talking about, and what they're getting. Now it's deluxe tunnels. Deluxe. Yeah, we like the word deluxe. Yeah, that's a good word. And then something tunnels and trolls is known for is the solo adventures. How did that come about? When everything else of the day seemed to be focused on multiplayer, having groups. 
Yeah. Well, actually, it, it may or may not have been a good idea at the time because solo players allows you to play it by yourself and you don't have to talk your friends into playing it, <laughs> whereas the group games, you, you have to talk more people into playing it, which is great for marketing. Right. But a friend of mine, uh, Steve McAllister, was with us at a science fiction convention, and we were talking in the restaurant, you know, as you do, and he, he was talking about programmed text, which was a thing back, back then in the 70s for education, uh, where the book leads you to th the answer and tells you what you did wrong if you come up with the wrong answer. And I said, he, he said, somebody ought to do a solo adventure for role playing. And I said, wow, that's a great idea. And I went home and wrote one. So Buffalo Castle was the first program text, the first solitaire adventure for any role-playing game. Uh, it was before Fighting Fantasy, before Choose Your Own Adventure, before any of those. It was the very first one. And it was so popular that we started, Ken wrote a couple of them, and a bunch of my friends wrote some, and we just, we just kept going with it. So that was our niche. Right. And then, and then the rules light system of tunnels and trolls fit in well with that. Absolutely. Uh, it's not so complicated. So, and the, the book can tell you what to do. And you, you know, I don't know if, if, if you've seen it before, but the book has a description of a situation. You're standing in front of three doors. You, if you want to go in the left door, go to page 12. If you want to go in the center door, go to page 15. And you find out what happens. And when you meet a monster, you roll a dice to see whether the monster kills you or you kill the monster. Right. And and then also something that we on our the, my podcast love is we love Grimtooth. We love the trap books. We've reviewed them on our show. And we even had someone that uh, submitted a few traps to on Grimtooth on our show. How did the, the whole concept of Grimtooth and this rule... Uh, not uh, just generic supplement come about and just how instead of making it for like tunnels and trolls maybe just saying we're just going to put out this supplement and leave out the rules and just make it so flavorful um i don't remember whose idea it was to leave out the rules but we, we there was a couple of us talking about it but was pat mueller there yeah that pat mueller was there and there was also we were i think we were already doing the city books which were also non rule specific and uh you know we liked certainly we loved and approved of tunnels and trolls but we also knew there was a bigger market that we weren't able to reach but we had we had a lot of ideas so we wanted to find a way to do that things that i wanted as the publisher was to come up with something that nobody else was doing and there were adventures there were treasure books there were monster books um, all kinds of stuff, magic spell books, but at the time, nobody else was doing a book of traps. So we, we group, as a group, came up with the idea, let, let's do a book of traps. And Grimtooth was originally the, uh, from our Sorcerer's Apprentice magazine. He was like the, the moderator, the... He was the persona that I that I, I cooked up, and I didn't want to draw something that was as complicated as I normally draw. So I literally took a what was essentially a magic marker, a Sharpie, to force myself to do something that was less complicated, and said, here you go, here you go, quick draw, all right, that's this thing. And the here's an interesting story. I don't even know whether you know, Rick. Uh, Cat Strong is actually the person. We had a... a um, contest to, to name this character and the winning person was, that came up with Grimtooth was Cat Strong. She is now the president of SIFWA. She's a writer and creative person in her own right in the years since and she always played TNT and loved the Traps books and uh, had been reading Sorcerer's Apprentice and so forth. One of the things about uh, Grimtooth, the first one we did, we called it Grimtooth's Traps, and we went to the Origins Game Convention in, in uh, San Jose, California, and that particular convention is usually on the East Coast, so this was on the West Coast, and it was actually not very well attended as, as compared to its previous ones, and 
we released Grimtooth there, and everybody else was complaining about how sales were terrible. It was an awful convention. We were overjoyed. This is the best convention we'd ever had up to that point because we sold out of 100 copies of Grimtooth's Trap. <clears throat> so we obviously had to go home and come up with another book. And then so we called it Traps 2, and I don't remember whose idea it was to make a pun out of it. We'll call it Traps T-O-O. So we did that. And then when we wanted to do a third one, we couldn't think of a real good pun for three. So somebody came up with the idea of just jumping to four. So we did Traps F-O-R-E. And then, of course, we had to do Traps A-T-E for the next one. Yeah. And we just told everybody Grimtooth counted in binary. <laughs> awesome. And we made up a silly story about how Traps 3 was conceived, but it was so horrible that the military came and took it away from us and burned all copies. And that was before the thing happened to Steve Jackson with the Secret Service. Right, when uh, it was for the cyberpunk RV. Yeah. And they show, they show up, the FBI shows up and starts saying, you're selling hacking manuals. And no, we're not. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, I say sadly because it would have been great publicity. Nothing like that has ever happened to us. Yeah. Even though my company's initials are FBI, or maybe that's because of it. Right, maybe that gets you the free get out of jail car there. We know you're selling the game Nuclear War. Your initials are FBI. Yes, and we've actually, if you're interested, I've got some funny FBI stories. Oh, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> There's a couple of them. Uh, one is I have FBI on as personalized license plate on yeah. my truck. Yeah. <clears throat> Another one is, one day I came home and there was a black SUV with tinted windows sitting in the alley next to our house and with two people in suits sitting in it. And I walked over there and said, may I help you? And they said, well, our GPS told us to come here, but it's a residential area. We're looking for the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Google had put us in uh, to Google as FBI <laughs> for Flying Buffalo yeah. Inc., and so these people were fooled uh, into thinking that was where it was. There's no FBI office in Scottsdale. Uh, the nearest one is in Phoenix. So that's what happened. Uh, my favorite, of course, is a former employee of mine. His name Russ was applying for credit at Sears. And they asked where he worked. And he thought that flying buffalo was too embarrassing, that yeah. they, they would think he was just kidding. Right. So he wrote capital F, capital B, capital I and a small N and a small C for FB Inc. Yeah. And he figured that that would look kind of innocuous. Well, they didn't see the N and the C yeah. when they when came into the main office, so they called the FBI to confirm that he worked for them. <laughs> and so an FBI agent came to our office and said, is, Mr. is Russ here? I'd like to speak to him. He showed me a badge. I, yeah. Yep, he's in the back. Right? <laughs> Go get him. Yeah. So, and, and I went back there. And I could tell the FBI agent was trying very hard not to laugh yeah. as he was going, don't ever do that again. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Figured out what, you know, I, what it was. Yeah. So uh, uh, we also got a bill for the for, that was intended for the FBI once. Oh. The, they, well, they, the post office put it in the wrong mailbox. Wow. Like $38,000 for some computers or something. It was like, nope, we're sending that one back. And it, and then that brings us now to you have a partnership with Meta Arcade now and that they're licensing your tunnels and trolls and now bringing it into the computer world. Yep. Talk a little bit about that. Well, um, I always wanted to do something like that, but I don't have the financial resources to hire the people that can do all that stuff. Uh, so David is a real big tunnels and trolls fan, and he came to me and asked if he could do this. And gee, we'd love to see this on computers and cell phones and all that kind of stuff. Not only because we're hoping to make some money out of it, but we like to play it too. Exactly. It's, the ne it's basically the next step if you look at how tabletop is gone. Huh? It's, we, you started pen and paper, then the 80s came, and there was like computer RPGs, but you still weren't really tabletop gaming on it. But now with things, everyone streaming their games on Twitch and then playing online with Roll20, it's like the next evolution of it. it because it's still the tabletop RPG, of course, not a computer RPG. It's basically the Tunnels and Troll solo, but the computer's doing all the math and yeah. page flipping for you. Right. Um, 
So, of course, what that does mean is you can't cheat anymore. Right. No more. Say, oh, I, I beat that monster. Let's go to the next page. Right. Or just reading all the pages to figure out, okay, which what should I do to get the best outcome here? Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's one of my jokes in Buffalo Castle. I wrote a paragraph that says, you have found this wonderful magic sword and all of these great jewels and yada, 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 yeah. all these wonderful prizes, but there was no way to get to it. And then it said, now go to paragraph 27, and you go to paragraph 27, it says, you cheated. <laughs> you die. <laughs> nice. So I, you can't really do that in the, in the computer version. Uh, no, yeah, you lose some of the... Some of the charm of the old, but it's still, it's a nice way to get your fix in quick. The, and then now this is on on mobile, so you'll have it on your phone. I think eventually it'll be on Steam as well. So Yay. it'll be around for everyone. And I, actually, I'll be talking to David after I get done with you about it in more detail. But yeah, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I really enjoyed it. And uh, have a great time. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Roll for Initiative podcast is a production of Wild Games Productions. You can visit us at rfipodcast.com or contact us on our forums at osrgaming.org or even call us at 570-865-4210. This podcast was produced for entertainment purposes only. All other uses are prohibited. Remember, if your magic missile spell doesn't automatically hit, you're playing the wrong edition. Thanks for listening and see you next time on Roll for Initiative.